Through my scope, I see him standing there on the brink of oblivion. I imagine he is contemplating his existence, whether to take that step. He sways with the mild wind, allowing its breeze to caress him like a mother rocks her child. He looks over his shoulder, as if to see if someone was there. There is no one. I imagine he is alone in this world, and this is his only way. As he turns, the look in his eye has changed. No longer is it fear, but that of determination. He takes the step. I lean closer as if able to stop him. I scream in my head for him to go back. I instinctively reach out as though I could push him back from 500 yards away. I close my eyes, cringing at the anticipation of the commotion that is about to occur. Deafening silence. I strengthen in my resolve and look back through the scope, watching him walk towards me. I have trained for 20 years to survive in a combat situation, how to fight, how to read others, to determine if they are a threat. I've trained for decades to strengthen my mind and body. I've mastered the art of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I can accurately shoot my rifle and sidearm with near pinpoint accuracy. I have learned to numb my emotions by the loss of my closest friends. And seeing what my own rifle can do to the enemy. I can shoot a man in the center of his chest from 500 yards away and put a knife through his throat so close I can count the number of cavities in his mouth. I've gone through psychological profiles before and after every combat tour to ensure that I can still be considered sane. As he walks towards me, all my years of tra training, my decades of experience vanish like smoke in a breeze. I was lost in a sea of emotion. There he was, a child, no older than my own 13-year-old son, walking towards me, but not to me. He is walking to a discarded vehicle left in the middle of an ancient minefield, a leftover from a past war, a constant reminder of the horrors this country has seen. He walks with purpose knowing that if he makes it to that shadow hulk eroding in the sand, he might be able to find something to sell to the Taliban. He knows that the price is high. The bigger the item, the more destructive it can be, the better off he will be. An old artillery shell can feed him for a month, but anything can feed him for a day, possibly a week. He knows that the Marines 500 yards away are authorized to shoot and kill anyone they deem a threat. His livelihood depends on what he finds, just as the weapon he wears across his back is his way to survive. He's been raised here, and he knows that there is safety in the field that has seen so much death. Many have tried before him. The field is strewn with signs of those who have failed. Shreds of cloth there, a crater there, even a shoe or two scattered about. He knows that where death once was, he is safe, because a landmine can only explode once. He arrives at a crater and jumps inside, resting for a moment, kneeling down as if to pray to his God to give him strength to continue on to his journey. As he hunkers down into the depression, I see my own children playing at the beach, building sand castles, playing with each other, laughing and running into jump holes. Not much different than the hole I see the child resting in now. Only 300 yards from my position. From this distance, I can easily hit the target. The wind is blowing slightly from right to left. The, wind is, the sun is behind me, erasing all shadows of my target. In actuality, it would be an easy shot and be justified under the rules of engagement. As I side in on the boy, I make the appropriate adjustments to my rifle. I firmly grasp the pistol grip, pulling it slightly toward me, ensuring the stock for the weapon is comfortably in the pocket of my shoulder. I rest the barrel of my weapon in the palm of my forward hand, allowing it to just lay there until the moment is necessary. 
My trigger finger hovers next to the trigger, waiting. My position is perfect. No one, no one will question why I pulled the trigger. I would more than likely get a few good jobs and wow from the younger, less seasoned Marines who talk openly about seeing action and wanting to shoot something other than a paper target. Young Marines that have been raised in front of a television screen playing modern warfare in simulated wars around the world, who also tend to treat life just as another simulation. But there is no reset button, no pause, and no cheat codes. I hold my position, watching the target with my finger next to the trigger. He lifts himself out of his hole and stands on the threshold, his prize a mere 50 yards away. But it might as well be 100, 1,000, or 10,000 yards, for the distance isn't the problem. It's what's between and underneath. He takes the step and begins to walk again. As he moves, his eyes are vigilant, shifting, searching for any tell of possible danger. Nothing can be seen. Footstep after footstep, his body tenses that it might be his last. I can see him clearer now. The sweat on his brow, the dirt on his face, and even the beginning of manhood as a slight wispy mustache is starting to darken above his lip. I can also see he is no stranger to war. A ragged scar runs from where his left ear should be to the corner of his mouth. He is missing two fingers from his left hand, and I postulate that the entire left side of his body is battle damaged in some way. Possibly the effects of a landmine he was fortunate to walk away from. More than likely, as I have seen too many times, when he was an infant, his mother shielded him from the danger, protecting him with her own body, leaving scars as a reminder of her love. I watch closely. He is just 25 yards away. His pace is slow and methodical, choosing each step carefully. I again reminisce of my children when I send them to bed for the evening. The slow, intentional walk down the hall, hoping a reprieve might come, allowing them to watch just one more show. No reprieve ever comes from me, nor will there be for the boy who rests squarely in my sights. He is only yards away from the, the fruit of his labors within his grasp. My body stiffens as he climbs into the mangled mass of the vehicle whose ancient armor shields him from my sight. The world envelops me. Behind me, I can hear the distant sound of music playing on a radio. Marines on a break from what lies outside our walls are playing cards to occupy their minds. The smell of baked chicken being prepared for the evening meal lofts up to me. And for a moment, I can relax and take in the world. Tick, tick, tick. The hours of the second hand slowly pass. When I see the boy exiting the vehicle, I am funneled back into the reality that lay in my sights. In his hands is a wooden box filled with miscellaneous wires and pieces of scrap metal, but resting on top is his personal fortune, a cylindrical shaped object that resembles an old Soviet motor shell. The boy doesn't waste any time. He begins crossing the field as fast as possible, attempting to retrace his steps that has brought him to his personal treasure trove. Thud, thud, thud. The emptying and filling of my heart is now keeping time. I tighten in my position to ensure I can get a clean shot. The boy has now become the enemy, never mind the rifle he wears across his back. Every six-year-old in this country has one. The mortar shell, if sold to the Taliban, can be used against the Marines and soldiers in the field. He moves quickly. I adjust for his speed. My finger slips into the trigger well, and I can feel the cold, warm still, warmth of the still as I apply pressure. My weapon is ready. He reaches the crater where I imagine him praying and abruptly stops. He's frozen. Not a muscle is moving. Can he feel the barrel of my rifle bearing down on him? He, he's motionless. Beads of sweat roll down the back of his neck. He's breathing heavy. He stands for what seems like eternity. Click. I apply more pressure to my trigger. 
He slowly lowers the box of goods down from his chest and looks up towards the sky. Click. I place my thumb on the safety, ready to unleash the dogs of war. He takes one more step. Boom! The outpost siren is swelling, and every Marine from around the compound stops what they are doing and rushes to the perimeter with rifles in hand to defend our position. It takes the cloud of sand and debris from the explosion 10 minutes to finally settle. After a few minutes, the all clear is sounded, and everyone goes back to what they were doing. The music starts to play, the games continue, and I helplessly look out across the field of oblivion. A torrent of emotion swells. I am confused. Was that me? No. My weapon is still on safe. Where is the boy? He's gone. I am thankful it wasn't me. I didn't have to. I would have. I could have. This time, this time, it wasn't my choice. My soul, though empty, is still intact. I am angry and demoralized. I understand why the boy made the trek. All this child wanted was to survive. I think of all the children who have crossed my path, the ones on the side of the road begging for change, the ones in the refugee camps and never-ending lines, even the ones who have stolen from me. They all had one thing in common, the will to survive. That boy was doing what he had to do to survive, looking for a way to survive for more than just today. Just so he wouldn't have to walk through a minefield tomorrow. I wonder how my own children would survive in a land as hostile as the one the boy lived in. Would they do what it takes? Wow. Thank you. I'm so